This is In Character. I'm your host, Gerard Robinson, Vice President for Education at the Advanced Studies in Culture Foundation. Hello, everyone. My name is Gerard Robinson. I am the Vice President for Education at the Advanced Studies Culture and Foundation located in beautiful Charlottesville, Virginia. This is the kickoff uh, for fall 2021 for In Culture. And those of you who've watched us before, you know this is an opportunity for me to talk to to educators from across the country, in fact, across both sides of the pond, to have conversations about education on many different issues, and tonight is no different. In fact, tonight we're going to talk about instructional coaches. Uh, it's a part of the teaching and professional development work that we as the public often don't have great insight to. Uh, we kind of lump everyone into educator or teacher, and understandably so, but there are people who teach, but who also have people who help them teach, and people who actually who've been in the classroom and see it differently. So we decided to bring together people from around the country to have this conversation. And because this is the first one we're doing for fall uh, 2021, let me say welcome to everyone and thank you for being the first one of the school year. Now you may be familiar with one face, uh, Monica Washington has been with us before. She was part of a conversation we had uh, earlier this year. So glad to have her back in a, another familiar face in here as well. So here's what we're going to do. Uh, I'm going to start off with Marguerite because she's closest to me, at least on my screen. You know, we're going to do a round robin. Just tell me your first and last name, where you work. And the question is, what attracted you to the field of education? Okay. Hi, everybody. I am the teacher center director of my, the former district that I worked in for in that district, 27 years. So what I do is I design professional development for this district and I tap teachers who I know have an area of expertise and I coach them and support them as they present their area of expertise to their colleagues. That's what I'm doing now. I'm also on a couple of boards, national education boards and probably like four other things that I can't think of and they're not so important. Um, what attracted me to education? I love that question. The first thing I thought of was um, Secretary Duncan. He called teachers nation builders. And I think the most important job in the world is teaching and to create the kind of situations where people are thinking critically and they're evaluating uh, sources of information. I, I can't imagine a more important job, not just now in this history that we're living through, but forever. I, I always thought it was singularly the most important job in the world because we affect 20, 30 students at a time. Doctors and lawyers only have to deal with one or two at a time. I'm not impressed with them. Got it. And my wife, who's an attorney, just walked by, but I made sure that uh, we won't hear about that. We'll talk about that later. Let me go to um, Africa, uh, who I see here as well. Same questions for you. Wonderful. Well, hello, everyone. I'm so excited to be here. I am Africa Afeni Mills. I am the D Director of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion for a company called Better Lesson. Um, Better Lesson provides professional learning experiences and opportunities for educators across the country, and I believe in a couple of other countries as well. I think we're starting to, to veer out beyond the borders of the United States. And, um, and I've been an educator for the past 23 years, started out as an elementary classroom teacher. And that connects to my answer to the question of why um, I became an educator. I grew up in Brooklyn, New York, and had the privilege of attending um, my neighborhood elementary school where it was just, I mean, I don't know how the teachers felt about it, but I loved it because it was like, we had like no desks, you know, you know, we, we would all sat on the carpet. There were no walls, it was very open concept classrooms. And I had the same two teachers in fourth and fifth grade. And um, they were, amazing. They they engaged us so beautifully in learning. And I think that's why I was attracted to not only becoming an educator, but becoming an elementary, upper elementary educator in particular. What PS number? PS 397A. Got it. All right. Got it. Okay. I was, I was in flat flatbush. Flatbush. Yeah. 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 All right. 
Michael, let's kick it to you. Hi, everyone. My name is Mike Soskal. I am an elementary STEM teacher in Northeastern Pennsylvania. Uh, prior to that, I spent a couple of years as a curriculum coach, K-12 in my district. Um, I published a couple of books on education. Uh, but what yeah, I don't have a great story of, of why I chose teaching. I, I probably chose it for some of the wrong reasons. Uh, I was a youth sports coach, and um, I love seeing kids light up, and um, you know, I, I loved coaching soccer. And really, I didn't think that you know, I didn't think that teaching was was my passion at the time. Uh, I, I knew that coaching was, and I wanted a job that was going to let me keep coaching. Uh, but as soon as I stepped into an elementary classroom, I realized the power of um, seeing kids just be their amazing selves, and I wanted more of that. I wanted to help them do that, uh, and I'm now in my 25th year of doing that, and I, I love every minute of it. Got it. Let's go to you, Diane. Hi everybody, I'm Diane Smokarowski and I am the coordinator of digital literacy in the Wichita Public Schools in Kansas. But I come from middle school language arts. That's where you know I've learned all of the good things to be a great teacher and technology classes. So I've, I've kind of between STEM and, and ELA, bringing the humanities and STEM together is my passion. And I chose education because I was four years old and I was in preschool and I was sitting on this very simple cot, listening to teachers lesson plan for the next day. And that sounded exceedingly more exciting than what I was doing sitting on <laughs> this cot. And I said, you know, someday I am going to be a teacher and I'm going to get to create all day long. And that never has changed. This is my 25th year in the classroom. And I, I just get to create and investigate, bounce ideas, design for human-centered experiences, and mm -hmm. it just never gets old. It, it lights me up still to this day. Thank you. Let's go to Monica. Hello, everybody. Good to see everybody. Um, so I'm Monica Washington. I am a senior manager of inclusive and responsive education practices for Better Lesson. My colleague Africa just told you a little bit about what we do as a company. Um, I have been Let's see, I walked into my first classroom 24 years ago, um, 1998, Memphis, Tennessee. And I got there because of my mom who never wanted to teach and because of my fourth grade teacher who knew how to make students feel. And I wanted to replicate those experiences for my students. Um, started out, I'm that person who started out with like the teddy bears. And I went to my teachers and said, don't recycle the old worksheets, I'll take them. So I was that person. Um, and just my mom opened up to me um, what books could do that could take you somewhere. So we would go and read together, go to the library, go to the bookstore. And that was fun for me to get a book and a donut and go to the park. And so I wanted to replicate that feeling of just going somewhere through a book or learning something new and feeling changed by it for my students. And so um, now I enjoy helping other people do that with their students. And um, it's always, I've never doubted that this was the right profession for me. So this is where I've been for 24 years and who knows how long. It Got it. When you mentioned where books can take you, I thought about Dr. Seuss, but I guess in the environment we live in now, I could probably move on to the next subject. Uh, <laughs> let's go over to Megan. I'm let's Megan start. Hall and I am in open world learning community in St. Paul Public Schools where I teach science. I coach Lego League and First Robotics. And I also am one of the teacher leads for a class we call crew. After an outward bound Kurt Hahn saying, we are crew, not passengers. It's a social emotional learning course that's multi-age for students in grades six through 12. Um, and I, I was not like Monica. I did not line up any teddy bears. I thought I was gonna be a doctor. And when I was a pre-medical student um, to show that I cared and wanted to give back to the community, I started volunteering at a home for children in Minneapolis. And I thought I'd be helping out nurses and putting on band-aids, but they found out that I could play the piano and had me start teaching piano. And through the years that I volunteered at St. Joseph's, I just discovered the incredible experience of being a facilitator of self-actualization and helping children become their best selves, their true selves. And I will tell you that 22 years in, it is even more awesome than it was when I first got started. It's amazing the number of people who were preparing to become doctors who become educators in the K-12 sector, some STEM, some other fields, uh, literature, humanities, and music. Good to hear that story. Josh, let's kick it over to you. 
Hello, my name is Josh Parker. I'm so glad to be on the call with so many people that I respect and admire. Um, and I am the senior consultant at Education First. And we consult with teachers and administrators and system leaders all over the country. And um, it's really interesting that you all have these paths because I also did not want to be an educator at all. Uh, even though my mom is a teacher, my dad, a Sunday school teacher, and my sister became a teacher. I was like, that's not going to be me. I actually wanted to be Kobe Bryant, right? Um, it turns out that you have to actually be good um, to actually be in the MBA. Um, and so I wasn't. So I went to school to talk about it, be a sports broadcaster. And um, when I got into that field, it just wasn't fulfilling. It was, you know, someone won, someone lost. And that was it. So I said, I need to do something to figure out what I want to do with my life. So let me substitute teach and just figure out from there what I want to do while I'm substitute teaching. And then I just fell in love with the kids and, you know, what kind of example I could be when I'm at my best and what kind of connection specifically to the boys that look like me I could make and, and make English come alive to people who may not think that it's so powerful. And uh, this is year 15 and um, I have no signs of stopping. So just happy to be here with so many great colleagues and friends and happy to share. No, I, I share your story. I wanted to become uh, Anthony Munoz who played all American mm. football player at USC. Went Legend. To Cincinnati and um, right. no, yeah, I got hurt my senior year, which I thought was the worst thing in life. And that was the best thing in life. Uh, changed my whole trajectory of my life. So that sports scenario is real. So let me go to the uh, lawyer hating uh, Marguerite since we're on the subject of uh, conversations about things. And I say that you were tongue in cheek. My wife's actually a law professor now. So, you know, this is really a question for the group. I just wanted to pick on her for a second. When we hear coach within the private sector, people get it immediately. What do people get right or wrong when they hear you're an instructional coach? Because it's like, so you're not in the classroom, but you used to be. And I don't think people really understand how important your job is and what you do to fill uh, the breach that we often don't see. So I will just open it up and you can just jump in as you want to and share some of your stories. That'd be great. OK, so you wanted me to start off, correct? Oh, yes, yeah, fine. Yeah. Um, I think people don't understand it because there aren't enough instructional coaches okay. and uh there's this is sort of this whole new idea. Certainly there weren't anybody uh, to, taking on this role when I was in school. And it drives me crazy because um, I think about people, like you said, totally understand the value of a sports coach, a, a coach in sports or acting or dance to make the person who's doing that job better at what they do. Real little sidebar here. I'm related to Vince Lombardi. So I'm all about coaching. All right. Yeah, through marriage, trust me. You know, yeah, big time. <laughs> With, what do you want to know about Vince Lombardi? We got it down. But the, uh, and, and I have a little, oh God, I, I swear I'll get off. So you know, I have those inspirational calendars. Surprise, surprise, Margarita Izzo has one. Today, the quote was from Vince Lombardi. I'll be damned. So, you understand that that Vince Lombardi, that a, that a football coach or best, a sports coach looks at the plays over and over and over again so they can fine tune the practice. Teaching is a very isolated profession. So who's watching you? Who's making sure that you're using the most, um, the best researched, peer-reviewed practices as we learn more and more about how everybody learns. So why aren't we connecting that neuroscience to the practice of teaching if it's the most important job in the world? I think, to circle back to your original question, I think the public sees it as an add-on, but they don't in any other profession. And the fact that teachers um, still have to fight to be acknowledged as professionals speaks to this much bigger picture. Yep. Thank you. Very good points. What was to add in? 
Yeah, I'll jump in. I'll jump in and say, I think that um, when we think about the fact that, you know, most of us, we, we have different pathways to becoming teachers. So there's some people who go through getting like a bachelor's degree in, you know, elementary ed or, you know, in secondary ed in certain content areas or getting master's degrees, or maybe you went through like New York City teaching fellows or Boston teacher residency or Teach for America. There's lots of pathways um, to become a classroom teacher. And at the same time, whatever program we happen to be part of, it's never sufficient, right? It's, this is, it's an introduction. Um, it's an introduction in lots of our classes, our foundational classes and methods classes. And we're being introduced to thinking about, you know, what it means to teach at different levels. And then we take our certification exams. And if we do well, right, we become teachers. And when we, we're offered a position, we become teachers. And at the same time, there's no way that we would ever learn all that we need to learn to be effective effective practitioners in that amount of time, whatever that amount of time may be, whether it's six weeks or years or four years. And so I think it's really important to consider the importance of ongoing practice. And I think like in the, the best in the best situation, an instructional coach is someone who's embodying ongoing practice and being a lifelong learner and what it means to, like Marguerite was saying, how it can be so um, isolated, but just really depicting what it's like when it's not, when you're not feeling like you're so alone and that you don't have a thought partner or someone to support you. And I think one thing I'll say, this will be a little soapboxy, so I'll say it and then I will pass it on. Um, I think a lot of times the public doesn't necessarily have, maybe in some ways, any perception of what an instructional coach is, or definitely maybe not an, not an effective impression, because we don't often um, marry together what we do to support classroom teachers with what it means to be effective in supporting teachers around family and community engagement. And if we did more of that, I think the families and communities would know more about what instructional coaching can and, and should be. Um, so those are, that's kind of my top of mind, my initial thoughts around your question. Got it. Yeah, I, I, um, Africa's last point there is very much uh, where I was going to go with my answer. Um, I think that our public schools are intimately linked with our communities, um, and, and we don't often recognize that as much as we should, uh, both in education and in our communities. Um, and I think there's been a narrative in education that, you know, great teachers are great, and we should fire the ones that aren't, <laughs> right? But we know there's a teacher shortage, and there's not a, a whole batch of great new teachers that we can bring into our schools that are just waiting, right? What we really need to do is elevate everybody who's in our classrooms to do a great job. And I think that's really where the role of coaches are. And if we want the public to understand that, um, you know, there has to be some messaging. We have to make sure that there's a clearly defined mission uh, for our coaching programs in our schools. That needs to be articulated to our communities and, and it needs to be tied to the needs of the community. Uh, teaching in a rural area where resources are tight um, and often, uh, you know, the economy uh, is is struggling. Um, people want to know how is this going to allow my kids to thrive when they get out of school? And everything we do, whether it's our coaching programs or any other program in our schools, has to make that case to parents. Um, and sometimes they don't know exactly what the, what their needs are to be able to do that, right? They, they don't have the educational expertise that we do in the profession. And so we have to be very clear in articulating uh, how our vision for excellent education, excellent teaching uh, matches up with their needs so that they'll support everything that we're doing, including our coaching programs. Thank you. I want to also add that I think what people get right about coaching in a school is that coaches help. And they might think that coaches help students or what have you. I think what they get wrong is that they don't understand that teachers need coaches. And the reason why I think maybe people think that, because you brought the comparison of a coach in business and a coach in sports. I think there is the perception that sports, like an athlete, the task is difficult technically. Um, a business person, the task is difficult intellectually, but that a teacher, the task is difficult emotionally. When in fact, it's actually difficult technically, intellectually, and emotionally to be a teacher, right? And there's a lot of emotion in sports and in business. And I think some of that too is because a majority of the teaching force is female. So there's, I think, some stereotyping to the position that's there. And so the, then that becomes, why would someone need a coach if the work is purely emotional? but actually it's a lot more technical and professional and intellectual and emotional. 
So I think that's some other reason why folks don't automatically track a coach like in business and in sports, like in the classroom. Good points. Megan? Monica, I see you now. So go ahead, Monica. Sorry, Megan. Um, there I follow the great Josh Parker. Um, I will say that um, when it comes to, and I'll piggyback a little bit on what Josh just said about, you know, that intellectual piece. I think so often when we think about the community perception, there is this per perception, or maybe it shifted a little bit in 2020, but you're the teacher, you should know all of this. You should, you, you have a degree, you know the stuff, now tell the kids the stuff, right? So why do you need anybody helping you? Um, and, and some of that, I think, is to that, that lack of the, the link that needs to happen between community and school, where we invite them in and say, yes, we have reading, writing, arithmetic, and all this other stuff, but we are also developing our teachers. We're not having that conversation a lot with the communities about the, the ways in which we are developing um, our teachers. And I should say, too, um, this is a little bit off the question, but I think within the field, we don't always really get right about what instructional coaches are and what they should be doing either. Um, you can walk into so many schools across the country and you can see on any day, any class period, an instructional coach being pulled to monitor the hallway or to watch the cafeteria. We see an extra body who can just cover a class. Um, and we minimize the impact that they could be having. We prevent the impact that they could be having by having more time with teachers. And so we're not having those conversations enough. Um, and, and speaking of that in the profession piece, too, um, as educators, we often, if we're in the classroom, we see becoming a coach as getting out sometimes. Um, and I was just, mm -hmm. Gerardi said to have, a, you know, tell the stories. I was um, in Lowe's recently and ran into um, a former colleague and she said, you know, what do you do now? And she was like, congratulations, you got out. I was like, no, like I'm still in it. I'm in it deep. Like I, I want to be connected to teachers and I want to, you know, help principals and superintendents. And when I'm not doing that, I don't feel good about my work. Um, so I think we're not having enough conversations within our own profession so that we can then create the proper narrative so that people do understand understand what teachers and well I guess they kind of know what teachers are doing but so that they know the support that teachers could have from instructional coaching stuff so yeah those are just a couple of thoughts thank you you know as a technology instructional coach this past you know 18 months to two years now has been a bit of a roller coaster of you know technology of teachers who were thinking oh technology is an add-on now I can't live without it. <laughs> there was a massive, massive shift. And without the instructional tech coaches, I think we would have teachers in more anxiety than and they had a lot already. But to have that encourager, that person who could build the scaffolds for them to have success and start to guide them that just because we went digital doesn't mean we still do worksheets. It's that shift of opening eyes and thinking differently about learning experiences. We talk often about education reform, but I think it's more about learning experience reform. And when we can guide teachers to think bigger, think globally, think project-based learning, think student agency, which hasn't been a big thing in the last couple of years, then we're actually opening ways for communities to change and school cultures to change. I think the instructional coach is not only the encourager, but is the side partner for dreaming and dreaming big for kids. Our job is to help make that teacher's dream the reality. We're just going to help provide the uh, scaffolds, the maybe even maybe the scaffolding, if you're thinking of building up something amazing in your schools, it takes the coaches to help uh, be those mental construction workers. Dan, I love how you're talking about coaches as encouragers and success makers and dream partners. I do think there can be a misconception that coaches are evaluators and that they're there to weed out the problems where, like Michael was saying earlier, we really can't afford to have that attitude right now. We need to have success makers instead. And I also think it can put a really unfortunate pressure on the coaches 
when there isn't the authority in that position to make evaluative decisions or change, there is only the power to make success and dreams and to provide encouragement. So I really like your language around that, Diane. So a couple of points that you bring up that I just want to put on the table. So you work with real teachers who had real challenges in and out of school during the pandemic. And a couple of you uh, highlighted the fact that we expect teachers to know everything. I mean, and when you said it, I was like, that's true. Wait a minute, you went to school, I didn't, you do the work. And we forget that teachers are also people who are also learners, who are lifelong learners. How did you work with teachers in this situation to coach them up? I guess, Josh, to your point, not you know, emotionally, but also technically. What, you know, we have a piece on uh, teaching in COVID. That's one piece, but you as instructional coaches, talk to us about what you've, been, what you've been going through and what we should be hearing uh, as a public. I'll jump in and say a couple of things. Like, I think the, the most important thing at first is kind of like what you were mentioning is that we have to remember that like being people centered in our own practice of how we support teachers, right? So it's not about like, okay, well, yes, I know we're in the midst of a global pandemic, but we need to make sure the kids are ready for, you know, standardized testing. And it's like, no, it really needs to be very considered around like, what is it that you're noticing? How are you doing? Are you, are you okay, right? Because you can't support a learning community if you're not okay yourself, right? And then I think really being able to help to like to be vulnerable and to say like, Yes, like think back to times where we ourselves, especially as early practitioners, or even in the midst of our, our career after years, when we have to take on something new, it can be so overwhelming and terrifying because it's like, you know, you're being evaluated and you might not be sure about it, right? So just really being able to really connect in an empathetic way to say like, I know what it feels like and maybe even share stories about, here's what it was like for me and trying to learn something new in a difficult circumstance. And then just really being someone to walk alongside. So I think about there was a teacher I was working with who was doing work like um, facing history and ourselves lessons with his middle school class. And he was like, can you just come in and, and talk to my kids? We want to do name stories. I want to connect with my students. Can you tell us about how you got your name? I'm like, absolutely. Right. Africa is like a great like golden name to come in and talk about. Right. Um, so just some of those types of things and just really starting to think about um, how to help um, educators to navigate what you might be seeing um, as pressure points. So for example, there were lots of educators who unfortunately were being like very pressured to be like, you have to have your students, they have to have their cameras on, they can't be laying down, they have to be dressed a certain way, you know, your attendance has to be this and, and families have to be held accountable. And there's a lot of pressure because even if you don't believe that approach, if you're being held accountable to that approach, that's a tough decision to make. But just really being able to say like, well, what if you did allow students to not necessarily, here are maybe some reasons why a student might not wanna have their camera on. And so let's think about some other ways that we can, you know, we can um, make sure that they are engaged that doesn't rely on that, right? And so I think also really being like that thought partners to help teachers when they were kind of having that gut check that told them that things, that they were being asked to do were not really humane, just really being able to say like, no, it's not right? <laughs> actually, and here's, here's how you can approach this differently. So I think just really being someone in their corner um, was really a helpful approach to me. Yeah, I think when I've helped teachers and I talk to a lot of administrators and system leaders now, but even in this um, period of COVID, I've been able to coach in two different dimensions. The first is, I think sometimes when I've written a blog, that's been a coaching because I try to get teachers who are my main audience um, to really think about things differently. And if they can shift their perspective as to what they are able to do versus what has been taken from them, I think it gives some lightness to the load of what they have to accomplish. And I have other um, folks that I mentor and other teachers that are young that I talk to, and that's more of a direct coaching that I do. But I also want to talk about the second way that I coach and what I do mostly right now in my job and in general, and that's coaching the leaders of teachers. Coaching teachers is important, helping them to understand how to better accomplish a goal. But oftentimes teachers are dealing with conditions that are not conducive to the great teaching that they want to do. So when I coach leaders on what they have to do in order to support the teachers, it feels like I'm supporting teachers at a better level. 
because now I'm not just focusing on what's happening in the classroom only. I'm focused on the school, the system where they teach. And so oftentimes I find myself coaching leaders on understanding content, understanding standards. So then they can understand the impact of their decisions on what they are providing or not providing for their teachers to teach. And I think what you'll find, I know for me, when I was in the classroom, I appreciated my mentors and my coaches. And I also appreciated the leaders who understood what it is that I do and can set the conditions for me to do it in a more effective way. And so a lot of my coaching now is around system leaders, the school leaders setting the conditions for teachers to be their best selves. I spent uh, or, and continue to spend much of the technology focus figuring out ways or helping teachers figure out ways to build deeper connections with students. So when we shifted to complete remote learning, there was this anxiety that came in to say, I, I don't see this. I can't feed on the emotions in the room. I can't, I can't tell if a student is struggling because we're in a virtual sense. So I shifted the things that I was teaching a teacher to do inside of the classroom to doing it in a virtual way and showing them how they can use things like improv games and build that fear of missing out because we, we just can't wait to have this moment together. That's where a lot of my shift went in the beginning. And then from there, how do we design learning where students do have a bit more agency? How can I help you scaffold the things that you need for students to be independent as well as give you the opportunity to work with students individually if you need to. These are the same things that we do when we do rotation stations in the classroom and blended learning. We just had the chance for people to pay attention a little bit more when we were all in a virtual space. But if anything, I think the biggest shift that happened was that I didn't have to sell myself to come into your classroom. It was more like, I really need you. Can you talk now? How about at 8 p.m.? How about 11 p.m.? Yes, uh, I'll be here as to help you be what you need. Uh, Monica said earlier that um, so many teachers are looking to get out and they see what we're, what we're doing is potentially getting out, right? And I think the reason for that, and this has really been multiplied during the pandemic, is the incredible pressure that teachers are under from a thousand different places in the system, right? Um, and that's never been more than during the pandemic. And, you know, Diane mentioned before that uh, the importance of student agency. And I think about school mission statements and almost every mission statement talks about developing good citizens or contributing members of society, right? Uh, in order to develop good citizens, we can't have children who simply comply with authority, right? I mean, you know, that's, that's the antithesis of democracy. Um, and so we wanna develop that student agency. But, but I think the best coaching programs develop teacher agency in the same way, right? It's, I, I think one of the misperceptions of coaches is that we go in and tell teachers what to do. And if that's the if that's the design, we're not doing it right, right? It's really inspiring their best selves in the same way that we want students to be. Uh, I think of early in my coaching, uh, my soccer coaching career, like I'd be the kind of coach that would stand on the sideline and yell at kids and tell them exactly what pass to make and you know what to do on the field. And as I evolved as a coach, I realized that you know the time to work on that was in practice. And once they got on the field, like I wanted them to be inspired and creative and all of those things that we want our teachers to be. Um, and when I think about how, to, how teachers need support during the pandemic. Um, instead of going in and, and, and telling them, like, this is how you can uh, do something great with students. This is how you can build relationships. Sometimes they just needed us to model it for them because they need a break, right? You know, like, hey, instead of telling me what to do, just come in and show me so that I can get a feel for it and do it myself. You know, how can I help you? What support do you need? How can I give it to you? Recognize that they're humans that are under incredible stress and, and try to support them in any way that we can. So in my role, I work with the entire staff of my school in supporting them to teach this crew social emotional learning class. I don't have any individual time with teachers. And so reading the room was my way of trying to answer that question you were talking about, Michael, what do people need? And our it's, it's a little ironic that our social emotional learning program was virtual for 18 months. We did, even when school came back in person face-to-face, we would have virtual crew um, on Fridays, even during hybrid learning. So um, 
for many years, it was just me developing the curriculum for crew. But during the pandemic, we got a much deeper bench and we had about 10 teachers contributing to those lessons so that they were more relevant for more groups that helped bring in the, the feedback that was needed to figure out what teachers needed. But then when we came back after a year and a half of never working with our social emotional courses in person, we pulled all of the curriculum. So instead of having something that was ready to push out digitally, we had lesson plans with gaps and then the teachers had to prepare. And we did training on, okay, here's how you prepare, here's how you get ready. So there are times when the need is so great that you go ahead and teach the class for folks. And then you also have to know when is it time to take the scaffold away and get people ready to come in. So I, it was very difficult to read the room during the pandemic. Um, that was probably one of the biggest challenges was figuring out what people needed. But that's the key, I think, just like you were saying, Michael, to figure out exactly what people need and to provide that. I think also when we, um, as a profession, we have a, a bad habit, I think, of always thinking we're not doing enough. And the pandemic made everybody feel like a first year teacher all over again who, you know, who we are all, it doesn't, it didn't matter. You were 30 years in or however many years in, you didn't know how to do it. And so, you know, as, as more people go on Pinterest and say, I'm doing this thing and that it's hard to get in those places and then go back to your virtual space and to not judge yourself. What did I say when I first came on this call? All the VIPs, right? We have imposter syndrome a lot of times in this profession. Um, and so when, when we're coaching teachers, in the midst of something that's incredibly hard and they may have that friend who seems to have it all under control. Think about, I love the number three, pick three things that you, when you were face to face with students, or if you were like some people were first year teachers in the pandemic, right? So what, what are three things that are really important to you? Building relationships, okay. Um, having students be completely excited about what they're learning, okay, great. And you want them to build a community. Now, how would you do that in a, in a real space? Now, what are substitutes? What are things that we can do in the virtual sense that still get at the goal? It may look completely different, but what are things that we can do and keep it small? Um, we want to do everything. And another thing that I've had to, to say um, to teachers is like, you don't have to know all the things. There is somebody who you may not be in the building, but there is somebody who knows how to do it. So making sure that we take five minutes to reach out to somebody and say like, hey, I want to do, I've never done Padlet before. Can you tell me how to do it? And um, to Josh's point about coaching leaders, that's another thing that I feel uh, I, I so agree with that. We have to make sure that the conditions are there, as Josh said. So a lot of times I would, you know, I talk to principals now and I say, like, what are things that you used to be able to do in person or, or something that you did in person that you could you don't do now? And you can take that time and let that be time for teachers to have connection. How can we be more, more intentional about saying, like, here, here are all the people who are really good at X. Talk to them if you want to know blah. Talk to this person if you want to know this. So we have to have those spaces and that time for teachers to, to tap into each other's expertise. Um, we sometimes fear asking, but we have to normalize asking for help. I'm terrible at it. I'm still trying to get better. Um, so I, I understand when people are like, no, everybody's busy. I don't want to burden anyone, right? But it, in order to be better, we have to ask and our leaders have to provide that space and we have to make that the culture. In this school, we are a family and we come to each other when we don't know how to do something. So I think just making sure that they're not inundated by all the new blingy, shiny buzzwords and objects and, and wikis and all of those different little things, but pick three things and do those three things well. And you're not gonna hurt the babies if you're really good at three things and then add one later. So it's just really about scaling down and then also also, um, as I said, to Josh's point, making sure that there is the space and the time to get better. I was one of those teachers who left her classroom of 22 children on March 12th on a Friday, and we all packed up and spent the weekend and then the next week learning how to teach virtually, which is something I've taught graduate school for 10 years. I've, I've never done this, folks. And when my colleagues saw my vulnerability, because they see me in the school as someone who's won awards and leads professional development, it would, they would be on these call, uh, Zoom calls, but they would be texting me saying, oh my God, can you ask another question for me? I, like I was mm -hmm. empowering them to ask the, the questions. 
Monica, you're so right. We're, we're afraid to ask these questions. We're afraid to show that vulnerability. I think teachers are. And a lot of that has to do with that evaluative process that I think is uh, needs a giant overhaul. Sorry, Charlotte Danielson. The thing that we said earlier, Josh, I think it was you, and I think about the work that many of us, I think all of us in this room have done together, um, is, is there's a, a dearth of, of, of codification of what it is that we do. I think Gates tried to tap on this. What is it that a great teacher can do in a classroom as they're delivering um, information or trying to get kids to ask questions? What, whatever the small, those little miniature things that we do a thousand times within 45 minutes, what are they called? What are they named? And how, if you're naming it, if you're articulating it, if you're codifying it, I think then it would make the instructional coaching a whole lot more valuable because people have a common definition of what it is that, that they're supposed to be uh, doing. Last thing, and then I promise I'm not gonna say another word. Josh, when you talked about creating conditions, I think that is the job of every instructional coach. I don't care what level they're doing it with. I, I mean, I think it's wonderful if you're doing it with superintendents and principals because they certainly are the enablers who create those conditions, but you have to get teachers to understand that they create the weather in their room. They create the conditions in their room. You, they have to become empowered um, to do this. And your point about it being a female led profession speaks to why we're in this quagmire, I think. I had a chance to, um, in fact, my oldest daughter graduated from Howard in 2016, and um, President Obama was the uh, commencement speaker. And he said, you know, of course, being president, there's always people having something negative to say. And I think it was his youngest daughter who said, Daddy, you do you. And we all laughed. And we know the whole thing of you do you, meaning you just got to do you. As leaders, we know what that means. But we also know as leaders, who's doing us? So where do you, as leaders, instructional coaches, where do you go to get fed? Where you can go and be vulnerable? Is there an association for instructional coaches? I think I know the answer based upon some things that Marguerite just said, but where do you go? Because if you can't get charged, how can you tell someone else you do you when we don't? I go to the faces in this room right here. Okay. And, you know, when we were selected with all of these awards and things, what was interesting was to be in a room with 54 other people who were on the mind collaborative mission of we're in, we're in this together. And I, there's not words to put around that feeling, but it was just, you felt like you were in like-minded spaces. And when I am needing that moment to take a deep breath, these are the these are the people that I call on or others like them and say, you know, what are some amazing things you're doing in your space? Can I spend 10 minutes to bounce ideas with you? Give me your story so that I can take that back and make a big impact in my own community. We give ourselves often to our colleagues and you know, I, I come with a lot of energy, but there are times when I just, okay, I need to recharge, right? So these are the these are the people that help me keep going as I tap on their shoulders. Thank you. And I would say that tapping on the shoulders of the faces in this room goes beyond having face-to-face -face conversations or virtual conversations. It's reading the writing. We have a lot of amazing bloggers in this community and sometimes it's just reading an article at the end of the day and hearing that commitment and that positivity that um, really sparks sparks joy for me. And I would also say that um, the pandemic definitely taught me about the value of slowing down and how much more generosity is possible when we have boundaries. So sometimes I just turn to my family and I say, I'm done working now and I'm gonna be on family time. I'm gonna work in my garden, have a healthy meal. 
And then when I come back the next day, my energy's back and all the great ideas that I've heard from the folks in this room come to life in my work. This might sound um, unusual and it was an unusual situation for me. I had been teaching for at least 25 years and I finally had an amazing, I probably shouldn't have said that, finally, an amazing administrator. I, this woman was take no prisoners, knew her stuff. She was brilliant. And I, I remember feeling depleted. It was a Friday and I was exhausted and I had been reading uh, ASCD articles and I had been reading PDK and I had nobody to talk to about this stuff. I mean, I was alone I, and I knocked on her door and we started a practice of maybe every other Friday, maybe once a month where we would sit and talk about some form, some aspect of pedagogy, some aspect of teaching. And I can't, I'll never ever forget how nervous I was to make that initial contact. And she was so grateful to have someone else to talk to about this. And so sometimes I think we think um, anyone in administration is untouchable and unreachable. And, and I think as teachers, as coaches, as uh, we, we can figure out who's for real, who's bona fide, and who's going to add value to our lives. I want to piggyback on what um, Megan was saying too a bit because I think it is so important like to to make that connection to the support we get from our own families. Um, and I know I just want to I always start by saying I know that everyone's circumstances with their families during the pandemic was not what my so I, I feel a lot of privilege there in the, the, the experience that I had and being with um, my husband and I were with our two children who um, my daughter who uh, finished her senior year and then had, had her first year of college. Um, remotely. So she was at home for next year, which I was not mad about that, being able to spend that year with her. Um, and then our son who didn't have his, you know, like last half of his junior year or his senior year traditionally. And we really just, I mean, we're a close family anyway. And during the pandemic, we really, I just got so much joy out of being able to spend time with them. And so I was absolutely recharged by them very consistently. And then also like kind of bridging to that is like, I have so many colleagues who started out as colleagues and then became family, like Monica, like absolutely just being able to talk regularly about everything, right? Like about, you know, about work and, and teaching and education, but also about life, right? And and even though one thing that I really enjoy doing, and sometimes I'm like, well, maybe I shouldn't try to introduce this because some people might think it's like corny or touchy-feely or whatever, but I love like, just like, you know, sending questions out to people just to be like, what's like, what's something that makes you laugh, right? What is something, you know, what is, what is, what is your favorite place that you've traveled to, whether it be someplace far away or even not too far, right? And just like really connecting to that human part of ourselves really kept me going and really in, in a lot of what other folks have said too around being able to talk specifically about our professional work. Um, but I think that humanity piece was really, really key this past year in particular. For me, I would say, uh, first of all, I'm really lucky that I am only the second best teacher in my family. And so um, I have my wife to bounce ideas off of all the time. Uh, and that's really helpful. Um, but I also think, I mean, you know, as, as all of us have been in these great networks that are created through recognition, you know, that, that we've been lucky enough to have in different spaces, um, you know, that's, that's great for us. We have those networks that inspire us that we can tap into. Um, part, of, part of my work over the past five years or so has been to create those kind of networks for other people. And I think that's an important part of coaching. Um, everybody deserves to have a network of people that they trust, that they feel comfortable talking to professionally. Uh, other professions do this naturally, right? Um, but for teachers, as Monica was saying, we tend to be closed off. We tend to, um, sharing is not, uh, is not something that is culturally uh, a norm uh, in, in a lot of schools. Um, so I've been working towards that. And, and part of that also is that is much tougher for our colleagues that are introverts. Um, you know, getting into a room and having these kind of deep conversations, that's not comfortable for them. And so we need ways for them to be able to access a network too. Uh, and social media can be great for that. Um, but of course, we know all the pitfalls of social media and how damaging to your mental health that can be also. So um, creating networks uh, that are online, that are uh, across distance, um, but doing it in a way that is accessible to all of our colleagues is something that's really important. That's something I've been focused on. I think it's important to balance reaching out and reaching in. 
So when I when I need to get refueled, sometimes I'll start with myself and think about what are some of the things that I'm forgetting in this moment? What are some of the things that I am not bringing into this space that I that I have conquered before, right? Uh, Brene Brown talks about this. What's the story I'm telling myself about the situation, right? Um, and what ha- what inspiring words have people, Megan, br- great point, because I the reading of all these great writers on this um, on this call, right? That can inspire you. A quote from somebody can stick with you. So if you invite silence for a minute into your life, because we have we're inundated with so much stimulation, sometimes if you get alone and get quiet for a minute, some of the greatness that these people on this call and others have said might come back to you and give you that. Then there's the external, right? So I love reaching out to folks um, and making sure everybody's doing okay. Like the most powerful thing in this world is a connection. And to be able to reach out to people just to say hi, to send good vibes, that is filling for me. Um, Because when I get that text back or I hear that voice or see that face, it it, it just makes me feel like I'm not alone in my situation. Um, And finally, I lean on a lot of text. I mean, I read a lot um, and and sometimes I'll just go back to the same story or um, the same scripture or something that I've heard in a, in a particular setting, and it will really refuel me um, to go forward. And so I think balancing the internal, because we have rivers inside of us too, right, that can sustain us. So we have to access those, um, but also reaching out to people and social media too, right? Twitter is the best, worst thing ever created, right? So <laughs> uh, it's toxic <laughs> and it's also hilarious. <laughs> And it's the best. It is uniquely American, toxic and fantastic. So um, sometimes reaching out to to those things is fun. It's just fun. So um, those are some of the things that I do. I don't really have a lot of extra to add to all the brilliance that's already been shared. But ditto, I was definitely going to just say something about the social media piece and about how to, you know, balance that. Um, But I've talked to teachers so often who say, you know, when I'm in these sessions with you, when I talk to you, I feel like, okay, I'm doing, I'm doing the right thing. This is what I'm supposed to be doing it. But in this space, in this physical space, in this virtual space, I feel very much isolated. And um, I talked to them a lot about how there's probably someone else there who's feeling the same way. So we have to figure out, you know, who our people are, um, who we can connect with, who can fill the bucket and say, no, you did a really, like in, at the end of the day, when I say, or I would just say like, today is my first day back at work um, after being on leave. And I was talking so much about what I hadn't accomplished or well, not that I'm supposed to be accomplishing something on leave, but I wanted to, right? So my husband had to say, but okay, can we talk about what you did do, right? So we have to find those people who will tell you, you may not have done X, but let's talk about what you did do. Sometimes those people are right there in your building and around you. Sometimes if you don't let that just be a physical space and find those people elsewhere, it will make you sick. So we have to assess where we are, see if the ground there is fertile for growth, And if it's not, don't lean there for your nutrition. Find out where that is, whether that is finding positive spaces online or connecting with a colleague who's working in another place who can give you ideas that maybe aren't right in your own space. So um, just not a lot to add to what's already been shared, but just, you know, just having that moment of saying that what we, when we reflect often, or I'll say when I reflect often, I start with the, the didn't do. So finding those people, like we have all said, the people who are in our networks or just find a network, right? You know, and if you're an introvert, maybe being a lurker on social media, just looking at what other people are doing, looking and reading the conversations, reading the articles, the blogs and whatnot. And as Josh said, and as all of you have said, like gleaning from that, what we need to sustain us to do this work. I'm gonna add one one piece if it's all right. Uh, One thing that really has charged me and kept me even going to think bigger is that it's this situation of the pandemic has been not only challenging for schools, but it's also been challenging for museums and zoos and nature centers. And having the opportunity to bridge between those locations and my school has been the most fun. 
uh, to where we started with the crazy idea of well, let's talk to the zoo and see if we can build a series of virtual field trips for the day and see if other kids want to be a part of it. We can't take kids out. Can we bring those places in? And I have 96 campuses in my district. How do I get 96 buildings and 50,000 students to have a shared experience? That was the that was the driving goal. Well, that one day in September of 2020 has fast forward to 330 of these adventures since then. And we're doing another one on Wednesday. And having the ability to make those super friends with the zoos and the museums and the nature centers and everybody who, like ballet departments, you do the nutcracker and they couldn't, they still can't give the ballet. Well, we're going to bring the ballet to the classroom in a virtual space. To be a part of that shifting of the mindset has been such a joy, and I, I'm excited to continue it. You know, Gerard, I'd like to add, too, um, being on calls like this, right, it's a good energy refresher. I feel like I want to teach again, like get into a classroom after just being on this call. So uh, just, you know, call it this with people that are this great. I mean, you have, you have legitimately great people on this call. So just being around those people and hearing how they think can be refueling too. Yeah, and I, let, let, me just, let me just add a little bit to that, Josh. Um, yeah, it, totally echo all of that. But how empowering is it to be asked to contribute? To, how empowering is it to, to be able to have your voice matter, right? Uh, more teachers need this kind of experience this kind of experience where we get them together in a room and say, okay, share your expertise with us and let's pass it to the people who need to hear it. Well, what I'm going to do now um, is rather than ask you a closing question is just to give you an opportunity to share in one word uh, how you feel now based upon this conversation. Just first thing that comes to mind. And of course I should call on Megan so she looked away, but I won't call on her first. <laughs> I think... Um, I have no problem, uh -huh. Megan, giving you a little time there. <laughs> the first word that came to mind was encouraged. Do you want me to elaborate? Sure. Very often, I, I think that one of the um, issues that the teachers face is a, a lack of trust in in each other, in the system, and in, in all of that. And maybe some of that is because confidentialities have been broached. Maybe, maybe it has to do with the way the system is set up itself. In this group, God, we really do love each other though, don't we? I mean, we just, it's ad nauseum here. But the fact is we trust each other. And when you have that kind of trust and it's been built up over years, it's the sort of thing that I, I think you were leading to this before, Michael. You you want other teachers to feel. You want to find their assets, like asset mapping that we do with students, and and encourage them to share their their um, their assets, their expertise. The this group encourages me personally um, with the work that I'm doing tomorrow morning with a teacher who's going to lead a, a course for me, for my center. And um, I think about everything that you've said and how I can make her feel uh, just better about what, what she's taken on. That's all. Thank you. Uh, Diane, let's go with you. No the word, word that comes to mind is lighter. I don't feel as much as weight of trying to get through to tomorrow and that there's another sound of, like I have another meeting after this that'll run until 9 p.m. But it doesn't feel so heavy. Just being mm -hmm. with each other and like and Marguerite said it best, you know, we really do love each other. So it's it's like this is a little family that comes into this space. And when I saw Mike Soskal today, I was like, this is like my brother. We've been friends for so long. And oh, this day's a little lighter, it's a little brighter. And it's almost as if, um, you know, it sounds silly, but it's almost like Gene Kelly and Dancing in the Rain. That it may still feel like things are pouring down, but I have my umbrella and I'm going to dance to tomorrow. So thank you for the time, friends. 
Yeah. Africa, let's go to you. Yeah, for me, the word that came to mind was just like hopeful. I feel hope. Oh, can you hear me? You hear you now. Yep. Oh, okay, sorry. Yeah, the word that came to mind for me is hopeful. Hopeful, right? I think, especially thinking about like what we all have been going through and are still, right? We are still going through in the world. Um, there's so much bad news that we navigate through on a regular basis. And even like, I'm, I'm one of the most like jolly, joyful people <laughs> there are, but it's hard, right? To maintain that um, when you, you know, we're hearing about like not only what's happening in the education world, but just with people's health and, and with the climate, like there's so many very heavy things that are happening in the world. Um, and at the same time, no no matter how heavy or how hard things are, are I feel like I mean, a lot of what Josh was saying before too really resonated with me. Like you, you have to maintain hope because you know, like it, it's it's so easy to focus on to like even what Monica was saying before to like focus on what we haven't done or what we haven't accomplished. But there's so much beauty in the world still. There's so much beauty in our relationships with one another, um, and so just really not to say and not in any kind of like you know, Pollyanna-ish way. And I know I'm probably dating myself by even talking about Pollyanna, but I'm like, just thinking about like, so not just, you know, just trying to be positive, but just genuinely leaning into um, what it means to be hopeful, because especially in the role that we're in as those who support, who are educators and as those who support educators, it's contagious, right? Like even when things are hard and we can focus on the hopeful part of our work and the hope that we see in children, right? Um, that that's, that's really what we need to stay focused on because it will continue you to fuel us to do the, the great things that we know that we can do in this world. So hopeful is the word that comes to mind for me. Thank you. Michael? Invigorated um, is the first word that jumps in. And I think so. it's so easy as a teacher right now to forget why you chose to teach, right? To think that your job is making sure that your learning management system is updated on time or that, you know, your kids are prepared for some unit test or that you're covering for some learning loss that happened, what, all, all of those things that teachers feel pressure about, right? But when you get together with people that have a shared vision for what education can be, the purpose of education, the real purpose of education, not, not, not just learning, but education uh, and everything that that word means, um, you remember, you remember why you chose to teach, you remember why you're going into school the next day, and uh, that's how I'm feeling right now. Thank you, Monica. Sure. I think um, I was playing with a lot of different words, but I think I've settled on the word centered. Um, so I'm leaving feeling much more centered. Uh, in this work, we feel just completely inundated with things, with stuff, with, uh, you know, with, with everything. And so I think when we can take these moments and just be still for a moment with people who build us up, who make us better, um, that gets you back to the center. One of my favorite lines from um, an India Ari song is, don't make no mind about falling down because when you're in that valley, you can see both sides more clearly. Um, so you can look to your left, you can look to the right and you can see, I am doing some things really well. And if I'm not, I can look over here and there are people who can help me with that thing I don't do well. Um, I can look in front of me and see a teacher who needs something that I have that I've taken for granted and I can share that. Um, so I feel I feel like I've come back to the middle of what I need, what I need to be doing in this work. Um, I have the tools, I have the people, I know the folks, I have the books. Um, it's just a matter of just finding the moment to digest what I need to digest and do that in a very centered way. Thank you. Megan. I, I feel toasty. I'll explain. I once had an administrator. She was very empathetic. She had incredible emotional skill. And she said to really engage in this emotionally challenging work, you have to find your light and you have to follow it. And you have to keep following it. And I feel like right now, like I'm right against the light and it's like toasty warm, which is great because it's a really cold and rainy night here in Minnesota. So I am, I'm just like warm all the way through just from, like I said before, the commitment and the positivity, it's wonderful. Thank you, Josh. I mean, I, I wanna use the word grateful. I mean, but I feel like joy is more appropriate. Like this, this entire time I have had like many conversations with everybody on the call in my head. Like, I, like I, I've enjoyed everyone differently. Like, you know what I mean? Like, it's just, cracking me up inside all the different and then also inspiring me all the different ways right 
Um, and people that I don't necessarily am on a call with often now hearing them like, man, this person is like a legend. Like some of the, the, the ways in which this person is bringing things forth and just remembering all the, the memories with folks that I have deeper relationships on this call. Like it's just, it's just joy really that, that everybody is still choosing to live and choosing to go forward because we have so many reasons to step back and to just stop, right? So the joy is in knowing that, and who knows what is beyond everybody's situations on this, on this call, because everybody's got something. But to know that at least in a part of everyone on this call, they're choosing to continue is a joyous moment for me because I know how much potential there, there is on this call. So just joy right now. Thank you. And my word is informed. You know, uh, this is why we get people together um, so that we can learn new things and learn from each other. Um, many of us are familiar with uh, Michael uh, uh, Gladwell, uh, who wrote the book Blink and others. And uh, he said when he was discussing about what it was like in the uh, Italian Renaissance, where the great names that we think of, uh, some of them actually got together. And what he said was so interesting. He said, they didn't get together because they were geniuses. It's because they got together that they were geniuses. And it's the getting together that we often don't do. And so even doing this virtually uh, keeps me informed. So that's my word for the day, uh, I would say for the evening. And so with that, I wanna thank each one of you for sharing your stories, for opening up your heart, opening up your technology, opening up your profession. Uh, to what we do. I'm sure people who are going to watch and listen to this will walk away with some new ideas and what we can do to be supportive to you across the board. A couple of ideas about schools of education, what we can and cannot do, but also there's some policy things because trust me, there's money in departments of education. And there's some couple of ideas that popped up in my mind in terms of how we can uh, be supportive to your work. So with that, again, this is Gerard Robinson, Vice President for the Advanced Studies and Culture Foundation in Charlottesville, Virginia. Thank you again for another session of In Character, and we'll see you again. Take care, everyone. <laughs>